morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you today to this second webinar, part of a webinar series of a campaign in the lead up to the Climate Summit, COP26. The campaign titled Transforming Agricultural Innovation for People, Nature and Climate is co-chaired by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and CCAF, the CGR Programme on Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security. The aim of this campaign is to foster state change in the scale and pace of agricultural innovation to be able to meet future demand for food. The webinar series aim at discussing the evidence of the label on how we can transform agricultural innovation system under climate change. Today's session is organized by CCAF, FCDO, and IDRC. I'm Judith Kebede. I'm a co-author of the report, which is the subject of the webinar today. I would like to thank the New Venture Fund, USAID, and CGR Trust Fund for their support to produce this report and associate the policy brief. The link to these reports are provided in the discussion box. There is now a broad consensus on the need to transform current food systems toward more sustainable models. And agroecology is increasingly seen as a framework for bringing to life this transformation. Agroecology is defined as the integration of research, education, action that can bring sustainability to all parts of the food system, ecological, economic, and social. It is transdisciplinary, participatory, and action-oriented approach. And it is grounded in the ecological thinking and farmers' knowledge. Agroecology calls for a holistic system-level understanding of food system sustainability. The definition of agroecology is complex. There is no single or ag agreed definition by all actors, especially in the context of climate change. The interpretation of agroecology in development has been divergent and contested, viewed as a set of practice as social movement or the science of sustainable agriculture. And the evidence for generating large scale impact on climate change adaptation and mitigation in developing countries remained unclear. This called for an evidence pros approach to find general trends from existing context dependent results about climate change outcomes, to overcome the current mixed institutional and financial support for agroecology, and to respond to donors' demand for accountability and, and more generally for evidence for the approach of agroecology. In this session, we summarize the quality and strengths of evidence for the impact of agroecological approaches in low and middle income countries and the programming approaches for large scale agroecological transition. This work is not only based on a scientific review of existing research, but this is also the result of a consultation and dialogue with a dozen organization working on the ground and a dialogue that we wish to continue today with you. So first we will show the report findings and in the second time we will actually have a panel of experts from notable large scale initiative for agroecology and donors who are invited to comment on the review findings and to give their experience about what is necessary to scale up agroecology programs. Finally, FCDO will provide closing remarks. Sig Snap, professor at Michigan State University and lead author of this report, will present the main funding of the study. Sig, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yodit, for that introduction to this very important topic. This has been a big lift. A lot of people are involved and we thank them all. It's very exciting today to be able to present to you some key findings from this rapid evidence review. This review has focused on agroecology and climate change outcomes. 
in low and middle income countries where we particularly focused on large scale agroecological transitions, which many of you may be involved in yourself. But what evidence base did we use? We tried a triangulation approach, three different types of evidence. First, there's been a plethora of systematic reviews, literature reviews, and including a number of meta-analysis of the literature. And we reviewed these and came up with 18 synthesis papers, which are included in the full review. We bring your attention to these because they represent over 10,000 studies related to agroecology and climate change outcomes. Global reviews in the most main, but some of them are focused on the global south. In addition, we did an in-depth primary evidence review, our own literature review, where we focused on agroecology in terms of nutrient management and pest and disease management. Again, in lower and middle income countries where we included scaling and adoption in our keywords. This primary literature review came up with 138 papers, which we then read in depth and documented the indicators related to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Adaptation defined quite broadly to include yield, but many other factors such as soil services and pest regulation. We'll come back to that. Finally, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 12 agricultural development organizations working in low and middle income countries and tried to learn a bit more about scaling agroecology challenges, enabling conditions. So the first challenge was what is the scope of agroecology? As Yoda noted, this is very contested. We know that social movements are important, but we focus for this rapid evidence review on science and practice of agroecology. Building on the recently published 10 elements of agroecology, by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. This has been developed through worldwide consultations and provided us a framework. The types of systems and practices are shown here, including diversified cropping, hosts for beneficial insects, crop livestock integration, agroforestry, organic farming, to name a few. We wanna note that we focused on agroecological transitions and larger scale landscape, and yet it turned out that much of the primary evidence was at the field and farm level. This has been a critique of agroecology that we need to, and many other agricultural systems that in order to fully understand their performance, we need to look more at the landscape and regional level, and yet much of the evidence is at the field level. So we note this as well. So what are our findings? First, good news, agroecology approaches do support adaptation. And farm diversification has the strongest evidence for impacts. So the challenge is that many agricultural development uh, in low and middle income countries, even in high income countries, that simplification is underway. And yet farm diversification we, is emerging evidence and consensus that provides all these different types of services. So this is a real contradiction and challenge that we put before you. More modest evidence is available in terms of climate change mitigation. On the one hand, a number of meta-analysis have shown that agroforestry and organic farming enhance carbon sequestration in biomass and soils. On the other, there's really a modest amount of greenhouse gas nitrous oxide emissions data, and almost none on methane emissions, particularly from the global south and agricultural systems. We did find a median level of a concurrence around organic nutrient sources, reducing or minimizing nitrous oxide emissions. So that's a finding. Third, agroecology approaches support local adaptive capacity for adaptation and mitigation. So agroecology has a founding principle that co-creation and sharing of knowledge, as Jodent noted, 
is part of adapting practices to local conditions. So although many agricultural development projects and approaches may also use this uh, principle, agroecology has been engaging with it from the beginning and continues. Now, this is not an easy thing. And in practice, it's, it's been hard to achieve, at least in some agricultural development approaches. But this is a founding principle, and we can see that it's clearly related to improving ability to be flexible and to address climate change and extreme weather might indeed include co-creation and local adaptive capacity. So we draw your attention to this as an agroecology strength. So if you take one thing away from today's talk, please consider this triangle where we've summarized the evidence. On the one hand, at the very top of the triangle, there are areas where more research is needed. Greenhouse gas emissions, there's almost very modest evidence from the global south. Resilience to extreme weather events too, some data, but in fact, it was very hard to find uh, many examples of this. It's a difficult area to research, and yet we do need information about resilience to extreme events. Agrological approaches to livestock systems also limited amount of uh, data. A modest amount and medium agreement around organic nutrients as being minimizing nitrous oxide for your attention. Finally, there are some areas which we think should really need attention in that they are strong evidence and strong agreement, diversification notably, and practices and systems such as agroforestry and organic agriculture, which also build on diversification, are, are important practices in agroecology. These improve adaptation and increase carbon sequestration. Finally, local adaptive capacity improves all climate outcomes and deserves more study. So this brings us to what are the enabling conditions for scaling up agroecology? This draws quite a lot on our interviews. On the one hand, as in many agricultural development systems, supporting markets, institutions, and policies are all important enabling conditions. On the other hand, agroecology as an information intensive practice and system does require and is foundationally built on farmer co design of practices. There's also need for systems to fit to local context in order to scale out and transition agroecology. There's also need for strong farmer organizations and knowledge networks. And I want to draw your attention to multi objective monitoring outcome-based in terms of what are the climate change outcomes? Now, this may seem daunting, and yet, again, the United Nations FAO has come up with tools for agroecological performance evaluation, or TAPE. There are other frameworks out there as well. So there's been quite a bit of work around how can we be more outcome-based, and we can move away from the contested labels to consider what are the outcomes that we all want to achieve. And that indeed is here's our recommendations and that's our first action that we suggest. Assessing the performance of agricultural development using an outcome-based approach. Let's move beyond labels and contestation. And there are tools to do this, such as the tape. The direct investment needed is also in terms of scaling practices where evidence is strongest. And again, we draw your attention to that there has been quite a lot of work on terms of evidence about agricultural diversification in particular, as well as agroforestry and local adaptation. Finally, other actions needed is we need to consider the need for evidence and build capacity in the global south to quantify greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural systems and better understand resilience to extreme weather events. A bit beyond the scope of our assessment was cost effectiveness and outcomes. We see need for this comparing to other agricultural development interventions. Again, bringing you back to this point about multiple scales. We need to understand more livestock scales 
and the need for valuation of more than yield. Adaptation also involves environmental and social benefits. Thank you, and I really look forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Sig. Wonderful. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Lini Wallenberg, and I lead the Low Emissions Development Program of CCAFs, the Climate Change Program of the CGIR. It's my pleasure to now host our panel of speakers. Uh, I want to thank uh, Sig for a presentation that showed us what the evidence is, and now we're going to turn to what the practice is. And I just ask all of the panelists to please, to please um, uh, put on their videos. And uh, if anybody has questions during the next uh, 20 minutes or so, please put them in the Q&A box. And I can also um, share that the presentation that Sig just shared will be, the, will be uh, put on email after this and sent to all of the people who registered for this um, particular session. So it's my pleasure to first introduce uh, Vijay Thalam, from the, who is an advisor and co-vice chair of the Zero Budget Natural Farming Program, also known as the Andhra Pradesh Community Managed Natural Farming Program. Over to you, Vijay. Uh, thank you, Lini. Uh, yeah. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Sieg and all of you for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, research. Uh, you know, very comprehensive study. I am also very impressed with the calibrated approach, the three boxes that you have presented, strong evidence, medium evidence, and low evidence. I'm happy that agroecology scores well on all the boxes, because what do we have? You have business as usual, which is actually contributing to climate change. So I just have one suggestion, maybe a wild suggestion, because we are in a climate emergency, I would urge all of us to even clutch at straws. And what I can assure you from our experience is that we have very substantial evidence on ground. And so I can assure you, you'll not be clutching at straws. You'll be actually looking at something which meets all the objectives very comprehensively. Because the, the principles and practices of agroecology, or we call it natural farming, are actually mimicking nature. So it's not that you know, we're only looking at one cause and one effect. If you practice agriculture which is in harmony with nature, you derive all benefits, whether it is climate change adaptation, climate change mitigation, and of course, in terms of farmers' livelihoods and better nutrition. So that is my, my first point, that it's a gold mine. So I would really very strongly urge more research, more investment, so that all of us are benefited by, by you know, uh, better science and greater depth in uh, what is happening. Because in about five years, we were able to scale up uh, the program in our state from 40,000 farmers and farm workers to around 750,000 farmers and farm workers. We are not offering any incentives. They are able to see benefits to livelihoods, incomes, health, cost reduction, and climate change resilience. So it's really up to all of us, the scientist community, governments, donors, to actually uh, go behind and support this effort of farmers and uh, you know uh, civil society organizations governments uh, in terms of scaling up governments are very important partners and uh, currently business as usual takes away 95 percent of investment so how do you incentivize governments to move away from uh, the the business as usual investment so what we found in our experience was that we could motivate government by the avoidance of subsidies. So whether it is uh, fertilizer subsidies, which in, our, in India is around $10 billion a year, or in terms of water saving, energy savings. So even energy for pumping water is subsidized. So we're able to report anywhere between 30 to 50% savings through agroecology which is uh, you know, a very significant and a very strong argument, which is uh, helping me to 
get governments to finance my work. We have already commitments of around $250 million by our government. I also, I need to raise another $1 billion to complete the work. And finally, I want to mention that uh, agroecology is knowledge intensive. So therefore, role of women farmers, farm workers, is youth is very, very important. And so a lot of investments have to go into knowledge investments. Due to paucity of time, I'll uh, conclude here. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Vijay. Our next speaker will be Batamaka Somme from the McKnight Foundation's Collaborative Crop Research Program. Thank you, Lini. I'm very comfortable with the review and I find uh, the data very strong and they resonate with my experience uh, implementing agroecology on the ground. I, I, I will congratulate the team as well. And I'm particularly impressed by the observation that there is a weakness uh, of agroecology in terms of uh, the landscape level. Because if you address uh, an issue at the pot level, there could be consequences at the farm level and even further consequences at the landscape level. And I'm very happy you highlighted that. Now, I wish that the, the review had given more space about the importance of uh, synergy in doing the work and scaling uh, agroecology. Now, drawing from my experience and the, the, the McKnight Foundation has pointed more than 80 projects of here. So I support that to scale up agroecology programs, we first need long-term investment and engagements. And those to cultural context, because uh, otherwise it could, you know, it could not create buy-in. We also need to be family focused for example, at the foundation, what we do is uh, we've departed from top-down approach or attitude, and we came with an approach that we call the Farmer Research Network, and we defined it as an association of farmers, farmer group working together with research and development organizations to facilitate access to technical, institutional, and financial support, we, which engages in research and is network so as to share information and data. So in putting them to, to, in, in the network, each category of network uh, of actors bring their strengths and weaknesses and they compete each other and you know, put the asset together to design uh, the project in a very inclusive manner. And we've noted that with the, 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 the far, farmer research network, the farmers, feel more involved, they're, they're, they're most of them, because we also add the leadership development, they feel more, they have more confidence in themselves and they are open to even spread, not only the, the, the information about practice, but also the, the, the adoption of agroecology and the technologies that derive from that. Farmer Center work approach uh, also allowed us to promote ICTs among uh, rural farmers, which is great, and because they can read, but they can use the, the, the cell phone, for example, to take a picture and make a comment and send it to a research database, and the researcher takes it. This proved very useful during the COVID uh, lockdown in West Africa. Uh, we, this, this approach has allowed us in, the, in our participatory plant breeding work, and that took about 15 years, and that has given real, real, uh, 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 I would say, real results uh, that involve everybody, that involve uh, the farmers, involve not only the, 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 the creation of the, the varieties, but also the adoption of the varieties. For the sake of time, I would end by saying that we need to create a monitoring approach that does not stand as a police, but that puts the, the, the grant, grantees in confidence to work and to share their weaknesses and learn from the weaknesses and failures. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. So while Vijay uh, emphasized the role of government in helping to scale up agroecology, 
Batamaka is emphasizing the, the need for uh, networks uh, that involve technical financial support and ICTs, um, among other things, and, and of course, farmers' reflections and empowerment. So now we turn to Sandra uh, Gagnon from the IDRC's uh, Program for Climate Resilient Food Systems, uh, where she is a senior program officer. Sandra? Thank you very much. As, uh, as Lini just mentioned, I represent IDRC, which is a Canadian crown corporation that was found 50 years ago to support um, the, the work, the practical research to improve lives and livelihood across the developing world. A research which is done by our sergeant partners to address pressing development challenges and uh, drive global change. So let me first start uh, by congratulating the, re the review authors, Sig, Lini, and Yodit for a very uh, exciting and well done study. Um, one of the things that picked my attention uh, is the call for investment to analyze potential trade-offs be between approaches aligned to agroecology compared to other agricultural systems and the need for more work uh, and studies in low and middle income countries. This is fully aligned with IDRC's effort to document and inform decision makers on the potential and limitation of different food systems in low and middle income countries based on robust uh, scientific evidence. The adoption of specific agricultural model by different actors from the community, the policy arena, will always respond to multiple needs, um, as the, for example, the provision of diversified and healthy diet, maximization of high value crop production, pest control, forest cover and carbon sequestration, or soil regeneration, for example. So these different models will imply trade-offs in terms of their potential for climate resilience, productivity, equity, or health. And they have potential and constraint that will influence who will win and who will lose within the system. So the development of more equitable food system will therefore require us to pay attention to the capacity of specific groups, such as those living and working in informal sector, women, youth, marginalized group, to participate in or benefit from different food system options. So several other elements uh, of the review resonate also with the work of IDRC on scaling of agriculture innovation. This includes, for example, the discussion on the need to scale out diversification and local adaptation processes through multiple agricultural development pathways and the role of policy and participatory and farmer to farmers processes in this. So our program investigated multiple pathways to scale up agriculture innovation. We did that uh, through market policy or ICTs, for example. This work showed the importance of involving the right stakeholder right from the start of the process and including the local private sector. It also questions the assumption according to which increasing the adoption of individual practice or technological innovation by a large number of people will automatically guarantee more benefit to more people. As there are many optimal scales after which uh, the return may in fact start to diminish or even reverse. Our work also suggests that there may be in fact limitation to scaling individual practice or innovation in different agroecological or sociocultural context in terms of efficiency, sustainability, and equity. And it supports the, the report recommendation to focus scaling effort on the desired outcome and system transformation rather than on individual in innovation. The understanding of the trade-offs between food system, their potential to inform transformation towards more equitable, healthy, and resilient outcome are at the core of the new 10-year strategy of, the, of IDRC, which was launched at the end of 2020. It is also central to a new initiative from the Climate and Resilient Food System Program, which aim at documenting the trade-offs of agroecology and other alternative food system in terms of climate resilience, equity, and health in sub-Saharan Africa an initiative that we hope to be able to launch in the coming month. Thank you. Fantastic. Sandra, reminding us of the need to use an evidence-based approach and remember that trade-offs are, are very real. 
Uh, now to Guy Tho from the European Commission, where he is a senior policy offer, officer. Guy? Yes, thank you. And uh, good morning or good afternoon for to everybody. First, I want to highlight that uh, the, the literature review is really uh, interesting but also relevant and it's a clear contribution to the current debates regarding the food system transition. So it's a very uh, document uh, interesting, just uh, you produce just uh, at the right time to help policymakers uh, to make some decision. Uh, first, I want to lie that I really appreciate the, the two dimension uh, you took into account in this report with the technical dimension and the social dimension of agroecology. Because agroecology is also uh, an holistic approach uh, which needs uh, to include uh, all the actors at local level, farmers, NGO, extensionists, private sector, to co-create the knowledge uh, and to adapt the solution to the local context. So I really appreciate this, this, this fact. Uh, so because it's an holistic approach, as many uh, people said just before, it's not just a set of practice we have to scale. It's really an alternative approach. And uh, for us, it's a quite credible and uh, relevant approach, alternative to sustainable intensification uh, based on, uh, let's say, uh, simplification, standardization of uh, the natural processes to produce products uh, based on monocropping and use of uh, external inputs. So for us at this moment, it's a quite credible option. So we really want to emphasize the need for such studies to support this reflection based on evidence and scientific uh, data. Regarding the second point, regarding the EU, uh, as you many of you uh, already know, uh, we, the EU Commission uh, developed the Green Deal policy, which is part of its uh, EU policy. And the Green Deal policy, for example, include uh, uh, an objective to be carbon neutral in 2050 for all the member states, and also include uh, consequences for the interaction with uh, uh, other countries, but also include the objective for reduction of contamination protection of biodiversity. Regarding the agricultural sector, the strategy is a farm to fork strategy. And uh, the, there is an internal dimension for, uh, for Europe, but there is also an external dimension for partner countries. And we worked with them to, to try to align uh, the vision, but also the objectives. And for us, uh, agroecology is a credible, as I said, credible options. But uh, maybe we want to emphasize two points regarding agroecology. We really share the principle you, you provided, you, you described, and all the elements you provided in your presentation, but we want to insist on the need for innovation. We need to, to invest in research to strengthen the ecological processes. We need research and researchers to work with farmers and other actors to improve the level of knowledge and to improve the efficiency of uh, agroecology. But uh, we also need to, the second point, we also need to, uh, to create uh, links between uh, agroecology and farming system and markets because farmers need access to markets. They, if they base their system on agroecological principles, they also want to increase their income. So we need uh, specific access to markets, but we also need to change uh, the, the practices of uh, value chain actors to have more responsible uh, practices to develop uh, a circular economy, uh, which is aligned with agroecological principles. So it's a quite important issue, how we can attract investors, private sector, and to modify, transform also the, uh, the, value, chain, uh, the value chain based on agroecological principles. Uh, in our case, we, we support actually, for example, we support agroecological approaches with uh, research innovation projects. We, we have our Desiree initiatives, 
and the zero initiatives, which around uh, 300 million euro with around 80 uh, research innovation projects. And many of them are dedicated to support agroecology, to provide evidence, but also to improve the farming practices, to improve the value chains and access to markets, to improve the services, to facilitate the scaling of agroecology. So it's an important issue. The second point, we are in the phase of uh, in our programming exercise. It means that the budget of the EU Commission uh, is in the phase of design for the period 2021 to 2027. And it's an option to, and it's an option to, to, to build uh, and uh, to strengthen the new uh, uh, policy agenda based on the Green Deal and other elements, uh, digital, for example, but within the Green Deal to really foster and strengthen the agroecological approaches. We also are fully, uh, fully involved in different discussion regarding agroecology. And for example, we are, we are part of the UN Food Summit um, uh, food system summit, and it's a huge debate regarding uh, uh, the, the 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 importance of agroecology compared to other approaches. But we also part of the discussion within the CG. And for example, there is also internal debates regarding to which extent we, we have to support agroecology or to support precision agriculture. And so we certainly need to have different pathway, but we have to recognize that the agroecological pathway, it's a really credible pathway. And uh, I, how long do, <laughs> one minute, Lini? You can you could wrap up now. Wrap up. So just last point is uh, regarding the scaling. For us uh, to scale, it's not just to scale uh, technology and innovation, it's to scale the process. And as many people said just before, we need to strengthen the capacity of actors to innovate, but we also need to strengthen networks uh, with different type of actors. We need to 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 increase the public and the private investment by attracting private investments. We need uh, enabling uh, policy. So what we need is, uh, is to change the rule of the game to, to allow, allow farmers and uh, local actors to really take advantage of agroecological approaches. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. And Guy's words remind us of the need for innovation and also that we're interested in uh, the su entire supply chain and how to create systemic change that enables more income, more investment, and, and overall uh, more scaling up of, of these practices. So we have an opportunity with the, the panelists who are among the, the leading donors and leading practitioners in agroecology, and then also with the, uh, the lead researchers on the study who reviewed the evidence, to now really have a good discussion about what is the evidence for scaling up? And, and I encourage people um, on the call to put your questions in the Q&A box, please, uh, not in the chat, but in the Q&A box. Um, we'll monitor both, of course. And, uh, you know, put forward all of your, your, your questions, either to specific people or to, um, you know, the group as a whole. And we have three great questions to start off with that are, uh, I think, generally to the co-authors, but can be answered by anybody related to the evidence. And the first question, I'll just mention all three, although I think they're, um, they're disappearing for some reason. All right, look, let me just check here. So uh, the first one uh, is from Stefan, and I, uh, from Stefan uh, Uhlenbrook, uh, who asks about the high, medium confidence evidence for agroecological impacts at the local scale and that um, he's asking about the landscape scale and to what extent we have evidence there. And um, you'll see that some of, these, um, some of these questions are already being answered in, in the uh, answer box, but uh, feel free panelists and authors to comment on them. Um, we also have a question about um, practical examples of how local knowledge is leading to scaling up. And finally, a question about evidence for policy incentives um, that encourage uh, uh, encourage people to consume healthier products from agroecology. 
So any comments on these, please? BJ. Can I ask the local knowledge question? Please. Yeah. One, one uh, specific example is uh, a case in Niger where uh, farmers are now using urine as a fertilizer. And they've, you know, the, 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 after some observation, the, the use urine that they sanitize using a, a, some kind of processes within there. And using that has allowed to, to even spread, spread uh, its use in the, in, in the farm because everybody and every family can produce urine as long as you have cans. And it is, I say it is a, a, a local knowledge that has been groomed and that to, to which uh, researchers join forces and uh, the use is now uh, very, very relevant. And urine it is, is even sold there now in, in some places especially in the region of Maradi. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Yeah, uh, I wanted to mention how two things. One is how important uh, local knowledge creation, co-creation is in scaling up. Because in our program, the primary role is that of champion farmers who are best practitioners. And we also believe it's an iterative process. So there's a continuous process of uh, creation of knowledge, validation, improvement. And uh, so by monitoring, investing on these champion farmers, we are finding pathways for scaling up. The second one is in terms of uh, incentives from the, from the government. Uh, I, as I already mentioned, it is uh, very important to demonstrate to governments uh, what, what are the other benefits of uh, agroecology? And we find uh, that there are uh, very unsustainable, very large unsustainable subsidies, whether it is in subsidizing synthetic fertilizers or in uh, subsidizing electricity usage. So by building evidence around savings in water, electricity, and obviously elimination of synthetic fertilizers, uh, that kind of research is critical for actually uh, getting governments to invest uh, more in agroecology. Thank you. I'll take another question here. This is from Marcela Quintero from SIAT. She says that it seems that agroecology agri reviews are more focused on agricultural practices per se, but not much on changes in policies, markets, and investors, which many of the panelists have mentioned is important. Um, and, the, the, and these decisions that are key to mainstream agroecological principles and food systems, um, like equity, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. Is this correct? Would this be an opportunity to support more application of agroecology with a food systems approach? Would anybody like to address that? Maybe uh, there was a question regarding, uh, previous question regarding uh, uh, policy uh, to uh, policy to incentivize uh, and encourage the consumption of LC products. It's clearly uh, a way to, to 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 promote or support agroecological approaches. For example, uh, you have uh, uh, initiative for uh, school feeding and to source your product from uh, organic pro organic producers, local producers, for example, in Europe, but also in Brazil. It's, it's uh, very relevant uh, levers uh, to, to support uh, agroecological approaches. But uh, you also have an uh, example of uh, educational program for consumers to change the behavior and uh, the way uh, they buy and consume products. And uh, for example, uh, right now you have uh, the, some uh, large uh, multinationals uh, want to take into account this dimension based on uh, the pressure of the consumers and citizens to have a more healthy diet, uh, also based on the new norms from policy makers to adapt and to produce and to sell, process more uh, healthy food. So you have uh, some uh, uh, 
Yes, a very relevant uh, way to encourage agroecologies through policy uh, related to uh, LC diets. Sandra? Thanks, Eleni. Just to answer the, the other question on the, on the fact that the review uh, addressed more the, the production side, and, and yes, all of us are raising the fact that the, all, many other aspects are super important. And, and that's exactly how we see the future of uh, agroecology is within a system approach. And that's why we think it's very important to, to look at the trade-offs of different models or different approaches to really base decision on evidence. And just as this uh, review aim at, like providing some more evidence. So, so yes, this is, a, a, I think uh, it's exactly how we see the, 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 the next step of agroecology is to, to uh, circumscribe it within the system approach. Thanks. Great. Uh, Vijay? Uh, yes, Lini, I just wanted to respond to one of the earlier questions. Uh, the investment also needs to be made in building social capital. In our case, investment in women's collectives, women farmers' collectives, and in the farmer to farmer extension system. So these two investments have been critical in achieving scale. And this also enables evidence to be appreciated locally and acted upon. So we're not waiting for only end of the year research findings. But there is something that there is a discussion about farmers' experiences happening on a very regular basis. So there's a different kind of appreciation of evidence uh, happening through these uh, champion farmers and women's collectives because they meet regularly on various issues. I just also wanted to just agree to what the questioner was saying that you need to invest in uh, many factors within the system. Thank you. Thank you. So on the topic of evidence and the types of outcomes that agroecology can generate, we have a question from Bill Grayson saying, here in the UK, F FFCC and IDDRI have modeled the potential for agroecology to meet the food needs of the whole country while delivering 45% reduction in greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions and freeing up land for nature. Are there any similar studies that demonstrate the potential for agroecology to do a similarly good job in low and middle income countries. Vijay? Yeah, we have some very outstanding uh, evidence uh, on the potential of agroecology. It's uh, relatively new evidence, but very promising evidence in semi arid rain fed areas where uh, only one crop is actually possible. That too, if the rainfall is good. The protocols that we have developed uh, around uh, natural farming are actually enabling what we call as a 365 days green cover and farmers are taking up crops throughout the year. And so this uh, experiment started only in 2018. Uh, in three years, we now have more than 100,000 farmers in all agroecological zones practicing it. So potentially cropping intensity can increase from 1.26, that's the cropping intensity in our state, we can increase it to 2 or 2.5. So yes, it is eminently possible. While at the same time, getting all the ecosystem benefits. And uh, thank you. Just one last point. You can also reverse degraded lands. That is the other thing that we are finding in the very first year we are able to bring these uh, degraded lands back to life using the protocols of natural farming. Thank you. Thank you. Guy? Yes, just to, to, to add uh, to these uh, comments, uh, if we have evidence at scale regarding agroecology in, uh, in uh, developing countries, for example, in, in the case of the European Union, we are involved uh, in an in a initiative regarding the cocoa value chain with negotiation with, uh, with Ivory Coast, with the uh, government of Ghana, with uh, multinationals and civil society uh, regarding the production of cocoa with uh, zero deforestation and zero child labor. 
and uh, based on uh, these commitments, uh, there is a possibility to increase the cocoa price at farm level, let's say to double the price of cocoa. Uh, so it's part of the discussion and negotiation. And uh, to, to, to develop this cocoa without deforestation, it's mainly based on agroforestry. In Ghana, you have uh, a long-standing tradition of uh, agroforestry with cocoa promoted by uh, the national government, national agency, private actors. But in Ivory Coast, it's a new new uh, strategy to increase uh, uh, the agroforestry. And uh, the first uh, elements based on uh, research show that uh, for sure we increase the carbon sequestration as a review demonstrated. Uh, in other cases, but also we increase the income of farmers. Maybe we don't really increase the production of cocoa, but we, in the same plot, we increase the production of other product, trees, fruits, uh, local products. So you increase the production and the income. And the objective of the, ivory, the government of uh, Ivory Coast is to have all the cocoa produced with agroforestry system. So it means a huge part of the southern part of Ivory Coast with agroforestry system to be developed. So it's, uh, it's a demonstration that it works and it works uh, with some investment from the private sector, but with policy commitment to have uh, uh, regulation, incentives, supports, and uh, you can really achieve uh, change at scale. So another, another case for systems thinking in, in relation to agroecology and, and its benefits. So the final question here, I have um, two comments related to agroecology versus other kinds of agricultural production. One from Simon Tuo saying agroecology versus regenerative agriculture versus impact at scale. How do you contrast these and what are the incentives to improve them towards more environmentally friendly yet um, food meeting food demands? And then we also have from, uh, the questions disappear as, as I'm asking them, but uh, basically I'd like to ask the panelists uh, to address the question of how, how do you compare agroecology versus regenerative agriculture versus climate smart agriculture, for example, in terms of um, their ability to scale and their impacts? And very brief comments, please, because we're about to wrap up. Uh, and I'm going to give Sig and then uh, Yodit a, a chance to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would just suggest that at our, one of our calls for outcome-based uh, assessments be considered. There are multiple strengths of different approaches, but rather than contesting about the labels, let's focus on assessments that are possible to see what are the trade-offs and what is effective at what. I mean, we consider that agroecology has strengths around particularly local capacity building versus regenerative ag is more focused on uh, soil health building. So those could be highly complementary, but let's uh, look at the outcomes and see what works where. That would be my suggestion uh, based on our review. Great, thank you. And Yoda? I would just maybe just um, complement with one um, remark concerning um, regenerative agriculture because it's becoming um, also an approach which is um, more and more um, um, in the field and, and, and also um, in the discussions today. Um, Personally, I don't see, uh, there is no contradiction or difference, high difference between uh, the approach of regenerative agriculture and, and agroecology. Um, the way, maybe the only difference uh, I will see is that actually um, agroecology really also uh, pay attention on the social aspect uh, and, and not only on the technical uh, aspect of the uh, transition and, uh, and the practices. So that would be my, um, that would be the, the only difference I will see. Otherwise, in terms of ecological processes that regenerative agriculture is promoting, these are exactly the same than what agroecology also promotes. All right, so that, thank you everybody. That brings to an end our question and answer period. And now it is my pleasure to turn to Liz Kirk for our final comments. 
Liz is the Senior Food Security and Commercial Agriculture Advisor for the UK FCDO. Liz? Thanks very much, Lini, and, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, and just a few minutes reflection on, on what does evidence-based approach to agroecology uh, mean for scaling up agroecology in LMIX? Um, first of all, to say that at the FCDO, we really welcome this report and its recommendations, and particularly the first recommendation around moving away from labels and towards outcomes for assessing performance of agricultural development. Um, of course, this report makes it clear that we need to better understand the latest evidence on performance, particularly in low and middle income countries specifically, and to address those knowledge gaps identified in the paper to understand where those opportunities actually are to scale up effective agroecological practices. Um, and also it's very clear that whilst we're all in agreement that agroecology is important as a framework for describing a set of possible approaches, there's still much for us to do, uh, both as practitioners and researchers and as decision makers. Um, so just a few words, what, what what is the UK doing? Um, it, the report's really timely for us in light of the UN Food Systems Summit, but also our presidencies of COP26 and the G7 this year, which have a major focus on climate and agriculture. Um, in policy terms, the UK is committed to promoting agriculture that regenerates ecosystems and provides healthier and more sustainable food that was agreed uh, by our PM in the UK's integrated review. And in January, um, the Prime Minister announced that the UK would earmark three billion sterling of our international climate fund for nature. So that would see us investing more odour in nature and in parallel making sure that our broader development approach is not doing environmental harm. Um, we're also supporting a wide range of programmes with agroecological components such as soil and water conservation and improved land use management, climate resilience and conservation agriculture. Um, so, so what next, I guess, would, would we urge for decision makers and, and the donor community? Um, I think this report and the entire series is really going to be really valuable for how we approach we refine our approach to our work on nature. And we would really welcome donors working together to make sure that we really are prioritizing investments where the evidence is strongest. So we've heard um, that's areas such as farm diversification and local adaptation. Um, and we also welcome the, the donor community jointly stepping up to help fill the gaps um, for more research on agroecology's response to extreme weather, impact on greenhouse gas emissions and cost effectiveness in, in low and middle income countries. Um, so lots of work for us to take forward as a community of decision makers, practitioners and researchers. Um, just in closing, I'd just um, like to emphasize the value of this evidence review series and, and to flag uh, the webinar three, which is going to be one week from today um, on June the 9th. That's at the same time as this one. It will be on the topic of a centering biodiversity research and investment to accelerate our achievement to global goals, especially on food and nutrition security. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, look forward to seeing you all there and, and thanks for um, a great thought provoking session.